Good morning, everyone. They tell me it's good luck to wear the school colors when you come to a place, so uh, hopefully this will help. Um, um, I want to actually talk to you today about a brand new idea that sort of came to me as I've, I've moved into the world of privacy engineering and thinking about that. Um, I, I, work at, I work at Palantir, and, and for those um, who, who think they know what we do, that's probably not what we actually do. Uh, what we do is we're actually a, we're a software company who build um, big data analysis stacks, sort of you think of them as large pieces to do data science, uh, and then take them and deliver them to organizations that have lots of different data and, and questions to answer and sort of build them the system that they need to operate it on their own. So a lot of what we're trying to do is like bring data science to non-data scientists. Uh, the place that we started was actually in the national security domain, and um, we thought really long and hard about what it means to build these systems uh, and, and the importance of building privacy controls into them. And so we, we have a privacy uh, and civil liberties team who actually both consult with our engineers on what features to build into the systems um, to, to make them both effective but also privacy preserving to the greatest extent possible and then consult with the customers on the right way to use those things. And I've um, had the fun of, of being kind of an adjunct on that team, a technical advisor. Sometimes they pu push me on stage and say, hey, you go talk about this. Um, we decided along the way that we were going to, that, 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 that what we had learned was too important not to share. And so we're, we just finished writing this book, um, which is not out yet, but it'll be out uh, probably September now, um, which is kind of, we wrote down everything that, that, um, that we know about this. It's basically, you can think of this as almost like design patterns for privacy. It's, it's like, okay, here are all the different sort of primitive architectural patterns that you can put into your system, and here, here are the privacy outcomes that you get from it. Here's how you assemble them together into a system that's really effective. Um, and this is, an important thing because we live in this age, right? Um, this guy really illuminated what's actually going on when, in terms of our um, relationship to the government, right? And, and, and you can think of it as like third party data holders, right? So you have the, oh wait, that's not the right one, that's that one, right? <laughs> um, uh, so, so, you know, the NSA has come to dominate, or the, the notion of the NSA or even governments in general. Um, have come to dominate questions of privacy, who can see our data. Um, it's even moved the conversation into a different domain about commercial providers, like what does Google see in terms of your email, all the data that we're giving to third party providers, how that changes the legal ramifications about who can get access to that data. What does your ISP see, right? What do we decide to actually just personally publish? Um, and then, you know, what, uh, just living the modern life, what kind of data exhaust uh, are, are we throwing off, right, in, in something like Amazon. Now, I, uh, I came of age in, in, the, in the tech world during the dot-com era, so like maybe that's the original language I learned. All of this is about what we would call, back in the day, B to C, right? It's about your relationship to all, which is business to consumer, for those of you who have never heard that term, right? Or, or G to C in the case of some, someone like the NSA. Um, it's all about your relationship to some other larger organization and the way in which your data flows to them and how they manage it and all that kind of stuff. Very important conversation um, and something that's ongoing. It's not actually what I want to talk to you about today, right? I, I want to talk to you more about the P2P question, right? Um, which is not actually about Napster, but I had the whole thing, a logo, so I was like, all right, P2P, Napster, <laughs> great. Um, we're entering in age, like if you think about it from the B to C, G to C perspective, it's all about, you can, like the, the, the terms of art there are about data owners and data subjects, right? And how do data owners treat the data about data subjects, about data they have pe about people, right? Um, but we're about to enter an age where we're all gonna become huge data owners, right? So um, this thing happened and everyone was like, oh, look at all the glass holes and oh, I hate glass, it's horrible, good. They, destroyed the program, they're not selling any glass anymore, Whew. we avoided that, right? I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Uh, clearly what's coming uh, is, like, if, if, the, if the people wearing Google Glass were the scouts from an alien invasion, it's sort of like cheering because the scouts have withdrawn, right? This was an experiment <laughs> to learn about how to do this correctly, and what's coming is, <laughs> is the actual invasion, right? Um, this may be also too much. This is a TV series from the 
man, maybe it was the 80s? I don't even know a, a, about an alien invasion, right? Um, and, and we're seeing this, like, this, this, this notion is, is starting to become pervasive. There's like this, this whole national dialogue now about policing that's, that's actually pushing body cams. Um, and so you actually have certain people in certain job functions, actually their whole day is recorded, right? That, that, that's already happening. Um, and, and wearable tech is coming up, right? So like the notion of a personal area network and always on devices that are recording what we do. This one's, you know, the Apple Watch is only recording like your heartbeat and that sort of thing, but there's no reason why something like Google Glass with a better battery, you can't just record all day. So we're running headlong into a fully recorded future, right? Where it's just gonna be really easy and cheap for me to turn on my stuff when I wake up in the morning and record everything that happens in the day, right? It's gonna be easier for me to just leave it on and think about turning it on or off, right? What does it mean to be polite when you have all this data about other people, right? Especially in the age of sharing, right? We have these incredible incentives to push out data, right? Like part of engaging with modern life has to do with how and what you share with whom. Um, and, uh, and, and Today, the free model dominates, where it's like, okay, we're, you, know, you give us your data, we'll publish it for you, we're gonna extract some economic value from it, but today it's free, um, so don't worry about it too much, don't think about the fact that you know, you're the product, not actually the, 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 the customer here. Um, and you can imagine taking this to its logical extreme that, there, that there's gonna be a startup one day that says, just give us your data, we're not even gonna publish it, and we're just gonna pay you for your data. We're gonna figure out how to extract economic value from it, but like, you have this great data stream, maybe you don't wanna share with anyone, but give it to us, right? So there's like, the ways in which taking this data and giving it out, publishing it, giving it to different people, like that's just going to multiply, that's gonna get bigger. Um, what this creates though, uh, is really a social problem, right? It's a problem that we've like, completely created for ourselves, which is if I have recordings of every conversation that I have in the day, and you know that I have those, but like we haven't discussed what I can do with it, how do I know what the right thing to do is, right? It's like the kind of, it's like, wait, I don't want to be an asshole, but I don't actually have enough information uh, to know what the right thing to do is. So, and this is not a new problem. Um, in fact, the, the first time that, that, that the sky was falling because of this uh, was actually because of this. Uh, in 1888, the original Kodak camera, um, right? You press the button, we do the rest. It was like suddenly you could act, anyone could just go out and take photographs. And so there's this thing that happens with technology that, you know, with, and it was the same thing with early uh, photography technology that like for a while you needed like a lab and a big box and a studio and the flash thing and like it wasn't easy to go take someone's picture. Uh, but now you have this little box and anyone can just go take a photo. And so in 1888, this was, published in the Hartford Current, right? The sedate citizen can't indulge in any hilariousness without incurring the risk of being caught in the act and having his photograph passed among his Sunday school <laughs> children, right? This was like, this was literally like the, the beginning of the death knell of privacy. And in fact, a lot of the discussion of this went into some of the early jurisprudence around what privacy is. Um, I, I, yeah, it's just kind of funny how that happened a, a long time ago and it, it led us to where we are today. The funny, the, the other, the other sort of aside on, on something like this is that um, when you go and look at the foundational question of what is privacy, it actually seems to be like a modern construction. So before industrialization uh, and before uh, the creation of cities where you could be in a place and move around basically anonymously, when everyone lived in more rural communities, there actually wasn't very much privacy. There were a lot of twitching curtains and people knew everybody's business. And so then, it, it, then you know, the Industrial Revolution happens and suddenly you can go move to a place. I'm going to New York City and just, you can be no one. You can, you can actually move around and have this, this notion of privacy and anonymity that never happened before. And today we're like, wait, how can we live without that? So there's, there's a certain, like we live in this sort of little special time where we believe that this is a thing that should happen. I believe that it should happen, that we should, that we should be able to preserve that kind of privacy. But it's, it's interesting, if you look in human history, it's like it's not a thing that's been a thing until very, very recently. So what can we do about this coming you know, data apocalypse, right? So we could do nothing, right? Um, and that would, technology would sort of march forward um, as the people, I guess it's that way, keep building things. Um, oh no, it's that way. Totally, okay, um, yeah, I, over where I live in the valley. Um, what that would mean though is that we could either like, 
e either you just have these, like everyone would be living the TMZ life, where you just have all these gotcha moments posted around, or it would introduce a whole new level of formality into what we do, um, where every conversation becomes like a conversation with a reporter, where you have to sit down and have a formal discussion about what the parameters are around the discussion. Is this on the record, off the record, right? We have a good model for this, and it's, a, it's, a, it's about talking to journalists. And I don't think that anyone really wants to live that way, where like you run this, hey, what's the sharing disposition of this conversation we're about to have? Okay, let's discuss that, and we'll figure it out, and then we have to remember it, and then I'll remember later like, not to post that to Facebook. Uh, so that's the kind of the do-nothing scenario. Um, this is Kevin Kelly. Uh, he uh, was the original editor of, of Wired Magazine, and sort of, he actually worked with, um, oh, uh, Blinky, the guy who did the whole Earth catalog. Uh, Stuart, Stuart Brand. Brand, yes. Um, so he comes up sort of from that, um, that lineage, and he's thought a lot about what technology means. Um, and, and he actually wrote a book, a great book, called What Technology Wants. Um, and he talks about the notion of uh, technology creating new choices for people, um, and that's like the good that it brings to, to the universe, um, and that technology itself kind of wants its own things. It's a very interesting sort of philosophical read. But basically what he says is, Technology can create new problems, and the way that you solve problems created by new technology is with more technology, right? Um, and so how do we then build new technology that fixes this problem? So we gotta start with what people want from this, right? So um, I wanna know that my images, recordings, whatever, aren't gonna be shared without my permission, right? Um, I want notifications about when data about me is shared, right? Um, and I want the ability to revoke p permissions, maybe change them after the fact, or request takedowns of things that, that involve me that I, I'm not happy with. And then the other thing I want is I want seamless social interactions in the face of ubiquitous recording. I want all of that, but I don't even want to have to talk about it unless there's a problem, right? I want, I want us to just be like there are no recording devices uh, and, and make things simple. So, so what does that look like? So this, I, I now work, I, I've worked at Palantir for like 10 years, so I've had like four different jobs. Now I work on the design team, so of course now I think about everything as a designer. Here are user stories about what everybody wants. Now how do we go about sort of um, coming up with the right set of technical requirements around this? So, so this is an idea called polite privacy, and I think it's something that we need to build. Um, so polite privacy consists of a, a number of different things. So the first one, uh, is a way to enumerate our privacy preferences. We need to be able to, to, be able to say, okay, uh, I'm okay with you recording this conversation, but you can keep it only for your personal record, please don't share it. Or I'm okay with you recording this conversation and you can share it on a social network with limited sharing, which would be like putting it on, on Facebook and sharing it with your friends, but not putting it on Twitter or, or flipping it public, right? Or you can share it publicly. Um, or uh, you can only share it, this doesn't exist yet, but you can only share it on a social network that actually respects the permissions that I'm about to attach to this thing. Um, so we need devices that actually seamlessly communicate and tag this data so that when we walk up to each other, my preferences are just sent to you and they're, they're, they're basically added to the metadata on the data in a durable way. Um, and then we need a notification and communications infrastructure, hopefully one that can actually preserve anonymity to a certain degree. So I want, I want to give you my privacy preferences, but I don't actually want to tell you who I am, which is an interesting problem, but I think one that's solvable. Um, and I want a way to know whatever happens to that data. Um, and and uh, an ability to contact you later uh, to say, hey, you know, I said some things in that conversation I wasn't so happy with. I'd actually like it if you didn't share it or you deleted it from your archive or whatever. Um, the cool thing about this is that it's all doable, right? So, so what I've imagined here doesn't require the invention of new technology or some new magical thing. It just requires putting together technologies that we already have in a way um, that make this work. Um, and incentives matter here. So I feel like this is actually work that doesn't, isn't going to happen in the commercial domain. This is not something that Facebook wants to build. Um, it's just—it's not like that they're so dead set against it. They just have no incentives to do so. None of the none of the places, none of the, the big tech companies who who build a lot of this stuff, who make their bank on data, it's not really in their interest to do. So I actually think this is something that belongs in the research domain. This is the kind of thing where if you build it and it works, and you have a set of protocols and standards and working code manufacturers may start to adopt it as a feature add in like their phones or their watches or whatever it is, and then it can actually become a, th a real thing in the world. Um, 
but it's not going to be built by the market on its own. And the other thing about this is that it's opt-in. It's not compulsory. This is not about setting black and white rules about what can be done with data. This is about giving people the right information they need to make good, good decisions to be polite. Even if I had this thing and we have a conversation, I can still take it and post it, right? I can strip the metadata and do something with it. Like, this is not about, um, it's not a legal framework. It's not a, it doesn't give anybody uh, an absolute sense of security, but, but privacy actually exists on some sort of a spectrum in some gray area. There isn't, there is no way to have absolute control over your data. The question is, can you help people make good decisions about what to do with data in the first place, right? So let's break down the different pieces of it. So the first piece is, um, preferences, right? So what do the preferences look like? So how can data actually be used, right? Shared in a limited fashion, shared publicly. Um, can they be shared with an unlimited license, right? So there's some really interesting language in places like Facebook, and I'm sure Google Plus has the same thing, which basically says any image you post, you're giving us an unlimited license to use for any other purposes that we want, right? Uh, and I think there are ways to opt out of that, but this is like come up in the real world where people are like, hey, that's my face on that advertisement that, like, that Facebook is putting up. Um, and can it be submitted for financial gain, which is sort of the scenario I was talking about before that doesn't yet exist, but like, if there are companies who are like, give us your live stream and we will give you $15 a day, uh, can, can my image be sent there, right? Um, this is a lot to enumerate. Um, it's unlikely that anyone's gonna sit down and figure like go through you know, some wizard that asks them 400 questions and, and know the answer to all of them ahead of time. So I think that there's actually a role here for, for trusted organizations that can create sort of sane defaults that you can either start with and change or just go with it, right? So the, the ACLU could publish a personal privacy policy or the EFF and say, here's a sane set of defaults or here's four different profiles that you can use for high, medium, and low um, to make it easy for, for, for the consumer, for the person to say, okay, I'm happy with these defaults, even though I don't actually know what they all say, right? Um, on the device side, this by the way, I know like there's a theme in the photos, you can barely see it, there's a camera right in here. <laughs> this is in Paris, like they have some beautiful ornate thing on the edge of the bridge and I walked by, I was like, there's a camera in there. That's um, very, very nice surveillance infrastructure. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you can imagine that this can be automatically negotiated via Bluetooth. Anytime two devices come into range of each other, I have a recording on, I can actually query, say, do you have preferences to give me? Um, say, okay, yeah, here are my preferences. Here's a unique identifier that tells you, well, that, that you can use to find me, but it doesn't actually tell you who I am, and I can issue new ID identifiers for every different uh, session that I have with somebody else. Uh, and, it, and, and in exchange, I give back uh, an ID for the recording to say, you can find this in my archive, or actually, I can find this in my archive using this ID. So later on, if you want to address this interaction, here's the, here's the token that you need to give me, right? Um, there's a negotiation that happens between the privacy preferences, right? So if I walk up and I say, I'm going to record everything and publish it, I'm on Justin TV or whatever it is, and you say, I want nothing shared ever, there's no way for us to come to an agreement, right? And that's the point where like your watch dings and says, you need to have a conversation. And then you and the other person actually talk about it, right? But the idea is that this, this, this conversation, the coming to the agreement on the sharing disposition only happens when there can't be automatic, automated negotiation around it. So the, the common case should be seamless social interaction and every once in a while someone needs to say, can you please turn off the camera or, or whatever it is, right? <laughs> um, and then I got ahead of myself, exchange anonymous identifiers uh, and preferences data automatically. So this all just kind of happens, right? And you can go back in your day and see, oh, these are all the people that I have recordings of or all the people that have recordings of me and I want to go back to this conversation at this time and place and say, contact that person and I can do it anonymously and say, can you please not share that or please go ahead and share it. Um, and then those preferences that are exchanged, those get automatically attached to the data. So they're sort of like put in a set of headers or there's some like larger archive, but the idea is that, that, that you can't easily, of course you can for real, but like that it should, be, it'd be, it should be hard to lose those preferences, of course not technically impossible. And then on the notification side, um, the way that you do this with, with like anonymous identifiers is I can just give you this sort of random string of numbers and then you can use something like BitTorrent's distributed hash table to be able to sort of like, you're basically creating anonymous mailboxes. Um, so it's like you put a message from, you put something in the hash table here for me and I know all the IDs that I have to check and then I can pull that out and we can, we can exchange, have a transaction later on without us actually exchanging who we are. If we want to, we can do that. Um, 
you want to be able to notify subjects of publishing events, so when you publish, you can go put something in their anonymous mailbox saying this was published here, like uh, this was published on Facebook with these permissions or whatever it is. Um, and I should be able to go back and reactively, uh, retroactively change those preferences, right? Um, the idea being I say, well, yeah, unshare that, or um, I think that, that actually doesn't require much explanation. The idea is that you don't have to make the decision in the moment about the disposition. You, like you, now you get a record of all the places that you recorded and you can change those sharing preferences later on. So this is like a framework for repairing the social fabric that's about to be destroyed by ubiquitous recording, right? It hasn't happened yet. And this was like, this, this came out of my journey through that process. I was like, wait, what happens when we all have data about each other? Then what do we do? And like, wow, no one's thinking about that. So this, this kind of grew out of that. And I want to get the idea about how to fix it out there before we break it. What's cool is that it actually leads to in, in some other interesting uh, directions. So um, let's assume we build this and you know suddenly we have polite society again, and that's great. But it doesn't touch anything else immediately. But where, wh what could having something like this make possible? So. The second approximation here um, is that you can imagine building social networks that only accept tagged data, right? Or deal with untagged data in some other way. Like if you want to share, if you want to share this image and it's tagged, fine. You can go ahead and tag it and put the person's push, put the person's name on it. If you want to share it and it's not tagged, well, we need to figure out how to get consent from that person or whatever it is. So you can imagine having these very friendly social networks, right? Um, that might be a pipe dream, but. Uh, it's not going to happen until, you, until the notion of tag data exists, and that's like a thing that people have, and they want those, those preferences to be respected. Um, the other thing that this does is even though it's built as a model for people interacting with each other, it's also a model for people interacting with environments, right? So what if I want to transmit my privacy preferences to a building, or the building wants to tell me what its privacy preferences are, like recording is not allowed here, or sharing of these things is not allowed here, right? Um, and so once you have this framework for that kind of communication, suddenly, we can, we can start building in the notion of tagging data with privacy preferences everywhere, right? Um, and what that gives us uh, in privacy circles is an actual path to ubiquitous consent frameworks. So if you go and you look at the FIPS, which is the Fair Information Practices and some other P something uh, that came uh, out from NIST in the 70s, which is the basis for all thought about privacy policies today and the way you handle data about data subjects, um, it talks about like getting consent for data use, right? And we don't live in that world, right? Like when I, when your data goes into Google servers or Facebook servers, you sign you sign a terms terms and conditions, uh, the the EULA that basically just says, hey, we're going to use this data for some things, and we're probably not going to really tell you about it. Like maybe this is a list of things that it can kind of be used for, but we're not going to tell you who we sell the data to or what it's going to be used for, uh, and we're not going to actually ask for your consent. The only place I've actually heard of this working. Um, was a very bizarre conversation I had with literally the president of Estonia. Uh, they have a very advanced data infrastructure ar around how their government handles information, that they actually have centralized records about everyone, but every time an agency accesses your data, you're notified, right? And, and that's the kind of thing that we would like to have in this world where everything is recorded, um, but no one wants to build it because it's, it's in no one's interest yet. But once we build it, then we can say, all right, here's this thing, you have to use it, right? So this is, my, this is my dream for the future. Um, I haven't started building it yet. I literally just came up with this idea uh, a few months ago and said, I should write this down and I should talk about it. Um, I know I have like about seven minutes for questions. I'm happy, I'd love to talk about this. I'm also happy to talk about Palantir. I know that's like, that's, I've kind of gone off on a tangent here, but if people want to talk about that stuff too, I'm happy to answer any questions on, on any topic, even ones I don't know about. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks for the talk. I, I wonder if you've done any thinking, or if you know of other people have done thinking around just the concept of data ownership. Mm -hmm. You keep throwing out the term, it's, you know, it's your data, it's my data, but it seems an awful lot of data is really generated that's shared, and that multiple people have claims of the same data. Have uh, you done any thinking around 
the, do, do I mean, I, I, I think uh, you can think about, th there's like a decomposition uh, there between who actually owns the data and who has rights around what's in the data. And there isn't actually a single answer to that around the world. Like the EU thinks about it differently than we do. Um, the, I think the, 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 the talking about it in terms of data owners, like I have put, I have built a system, I own and operate it that is, that is collecting or generating the data, like my web servers or whatever it is. I own that data. It may have data about you and that gives you certain rights around what I can do with that data, but you don't own that data, right? Uh, and and it, the place where it gets fuzzy is like when that data is an email that you wrote, and now you and now it's on my servers. I, I, I don't think that there's actually a very, there's, there's a lot of different ways to think about it, but there isn't sort of a clear model in the world around who owns data per se, other than if you generate it and it's on your servers, guess you own it, right? It's when it intersects with copyright is when, it, when, when there actually is sort of a clear sense of, of ownership, right? Maybe a quick follow-up is, I mean, what claim do I have at all over data that you've got that may, like, we're here today. Yeah. You know, you saw me here. Yeah. Do I have any claim over the, you, you own that data, you saw me here. Do I own any, do I have any claim to, the, to that data that you have about me? No. It seems like I don't, right? No, no, and that's, and that's, that's really why this is, like, this is, this is, this is about, uh, op, like, opt-in, an opt-in framework for good behavior. Right, there's no, this is not about like something that's encoded into legal protections or, you know, it's like if I have a recording of you and I've made that legally, like you know that like we're in a one or two party consent state and you know that I made the recording, that recording of you I own and I can do anything I want with. But I want to be a nice guy, right? And the, and the problem that this addresses is I, I don't actually, like if we, so I, then I go home and I'm like, should I put this up or not? I don't actually know what you want. And then I have like, I have three choices. One is not share it, like sort of, you can think of it as like chilling effects. Um, I could email you and be like, hey, so I have this video of you and I was thinking about putting it on Facebook and I don't know how you think of, how you feel about that. That can also like change that there's a, there's a certain uh, Heisenbergian like change. As soon as I ask the question, now you're thinking about it or maybe you were fine with it, but it, just by asking I've changed your, the way you're like, wait, well maybe I don't want to share that. Or if I have your preferences and I know that you're like, yeah, it's fine if you share it, I can just share it, right? Um, and so this is not about um, absolute rights or, or legal limits so much as just enabling good behavior. Because if we don't have that, like, like there are no rules about what, what I could do with that data, but now I have a whole bunch of it. Um, it could just lead to kind of a social nightmare, right? So, so I, and I understand everyone, like in, especially in technical circles, like you want to be like, no, 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 I want the, I want protections. I want the absolute black and white thing that says I have absolute control of my data. You're never, ever going to have absolute control over data about you, ever. Right, so the question is, what can we build that mitigates some of the harms that can come, uh, and, and especially from each other? Like, how can, I don't want to harm myself by doing bad things with, with data about you that I have. There's a great sentence, yeah. It, this is fascinating to me, and on a broad level, you're pointing at what's going to be a kind of crisis in society, Correct. which is the clash of fiction and lying. Like society is a necessary fiction and we're yep. going to start presenting all these abstract truths as if they're the reality. That aside, which is, <laughs> you know, epic. And, but um, what you said about thinking about changing, I think, raises another level of this that's going to have to be addressed. These are largely bilateral engagements you're talking about. Yep. But people will make statements based on triangulated information. So you'll need to sort of point to paths of inference. How did you come to that conclusion? What's that based on? Mm -hmm. You know, I said that in a bar, you know, after eight beers, right? You know, about the Green Bay Packers or yeah. something, you know. Yeah. It's like, so the, the chain of, of order, the, the behavior around the determination is going to have to get surfaced too. Yeah, I mean, that is something that ubiquitous recording gives you is the ability to actually contextualize anything you said because you know when and where it was said and in what context you can actually go back to the recording. I, that, that's interesting because like, I think that's a positive Utility that can come out of it? Well, it's a positive utility on one level, but like, could the police start to identify when I changed my preference? And would that be ev evidentiary? You know? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Because and, and they basically get to indict all the, uh, to subpoena all other behaviors right now. Right. Be weird if they couldn't. Right. Well, the other, the other direction this could go, and I think that's really pie in the sky, is that then if you, if you had this kind of framework, you could imagine, and it's, I know it's a stretch, but you could imagine some enlightened policymaking that encoded this into law, that said, 
all of, all of the ways in which you deal with your privacy preferences, those have very strong Fourth Amendment protections, right? Any, any, and then, and maybe even a change of the law which says, actually the disposition of data is such that now you need, like because it's easy, you need to get permission from people to do things with their data. So you can't just ship that video to TMZ or whatever it is, like that's illegal, right? Because, because it was technically not feasible to do before, we could, like something like this could get us to the point where we could have actual laws that would, would protect our privacy rather than just enabling etiquette. Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, have you thought much about personalizing your privacy radius or what crowds would look like? No, and that's, I mean, there's, there's some work to be done there um, about what it means to like, like who are you exchanging identifiers with and um, you know, there's, there's some like, you can imagine like building an advanced one that would actually like send out a 3D model of your head so that you could do face, like so that y the other person's phone could do face recognition to decide whether or not you were in it. So like, here are my privacy preferences, here's what I look like, and I'm not afraid to give you my picture because we were in the same place and you saw me, um, but you can use this to decide whether or not I'm in your data and whether or not these need to be applied to it, right? So there's, 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 some, there's some detail to be worked out there. Um, you can imagine that if the radius is tight, like maybe if I'm across the room, we're not exchanging preferences, you know, it doesn't work with long lenses, but it does if, if we're close enough that like you could capture my voice, right? Well, thanks for the presentation, it was good. I think you actually kind of answered my question because I was gonna ask about, you know, a big part of your framework was like the enforced tagging, right? And what sort of challenges you see in, you know, making that enforcement, uh, having a technology to enforce that, but. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the simple, the, 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 there's no way to enforce it, is, right. is really what it comes down to, and that's by design, or it's a constraint on the design, um, but the alternative is no tagging. So it's like, if we get some tagging, if we get 80% tagging, it's better than no tagging at all, right? So this is, this is like just trying to make things better, not try to make them perfect. Um, and, and at any point, I can always just like pull out my old camera that doesn't do any tagging or strip off the tag information. So it, this is not in any way about protection from bad actors, right? This is about letting people who don't want to be bad actors have all the information they need to not be bad actors, right? Last one. Thanks, sorry. Um, Right here. Um, uh, that was a great talk. I'm thinking um, more from an analyst standpoint as if there are certain people that are constantly excluding themselves from data sets, mm -hmm. is that it naturally tends to lead to these biased data sets. Is there anything you think that can be incorporated in a protocol like this that lets you know like who's being excluded from our data set so that we can, um, I guess, know how far to generalize what results we're getting in our analysis of this data that we can capture or use? Um, I don't think so. I mean, you could imagine that that actually could be a sharing preference, uh, which is to say, like, my data can be used in aggregate for research purposes. Uh, you can, like, you, you, could, you could add that in as, as one of the ways um, that, that it could be used. But I think that if people want to exclude themselves, uh, they should be able to exclude themselves. And, like, for, the, for the, the analysts who are dealing with that, like, welcome to job security, right? It's like it's figuring out how to get around that, how to get around the bias, um, which is why the job is not completely automated in the first place. Because if, if the data was the absolute truth of the world, then all these problems become easy. But it's not, right? Okay, we have one last guy that I can Okay, thanks. Um, so I had a question going back to that notion of sort of retroactively changing uh, the privacy preferences that you've sort of already granted. And kind of thinking about the notion of sort of the era of Twitter shaming that we seem to be in, I can imagine a lot of folks would say, gee, I really wish I could put that genie back in the bottle, but it might be too late, right? Like, that's already out there right. and sort of publicly available. So I'm wondering if there's uh, more potentially to be done, or if, how do we handle public shaming sort of under this framework? Um, I mean, a lot of the public shamings that have happened on Twitter have been people who have sort of hoisted themselves on their own petard. It's not like someone else put that tweet out for them, <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, so, the, so it doesn't exactly match, but, but definitely like if you, had a, if you had an embarrassing photo of me and you put it up, I want you to pull it down and there's, there's copies of it. Um, there's not much you can do. I mean, you can add in a permission that says, you need, you need actual consent from me. Like it's okay to share, but you need consent from me and you can do it through this framework before I, before I approve it. Retroactively removing something that's been published is really difficult. The place where retroactivity though is interesting here is pre-publishing but post-conversation. So we talk, and I go home, and I'm lying in bed, and I'm like, oh shit, what'd I say, 
right? And then I fire off an email or whatever. I use my privacy thing to send the thing to you to say, actually, please don't share that, right? And you haven't shared it yet, and that's okay. And I can update my preferences retroactively from the conversation, but before it's actually published. And that's, that, I think, is the interesting use case there. Retracting something that's been published is just always fraught, right? Thank you so much. Thank you.